Hi everybody, this is Philip Heidson here from Art of Procurement, and I'm excited to bring you this week's episode of our flagship podcast. Well, one of our primary goals here at Art of Procurement is to help procurement teams operate like strategic services businesses rather than a siloed function. You know, in our years of experience, we've identified this time and time again as being the game changer, really, for procurement teams that want to elevate their impact and become truly strategic. You may have heard us actually talking recently about our white paper series, Procurement Inc., where we actually start to lay out the steps you can take on that journey to becoming a strategic services business. And if you haven't grabbed yourself a copy, you can download that. You can just go to our resource center. It's a free download. Uh, The resource center is at artofprocurement.com slash resources. And well, today I chat with Evert Carson. Evert is the vice president of global procurement at Simpress. So from his office in Switzerland, he leads a team of procurement professionals around the world that support Simpress's multiple autonomous brands. You may have heard of some of them. It includes Vistaprint, Easy Flyer, and Build a Sign. Well, over the past three years, Evert has taken his team on a transformation journey that actually started with a centralized procurement team with a single company-wide savings target to a center-led group. And it's one where the goals are actually measured at the operating business unit rather than at the highest kind of corporate level. In this new environment, the team is thriving and their impact on the business has never been greater. And so in today's conversation, we actually discuss the journey to date. One of the things that I really encourage you to listen out for is how Everett convinced his CFO to change the way that procurement performance is measured. All right, well, as we go into the conversation, I start by asking Everett the same question I often ask in the Art of Procurement to start things off, and that is if he found procurement or if procurement found him. In the first company I joined, the position was in a um, relatively new team that had been created installing fiber optic uh, mm-hmm. cables that was the newest thing at the time and in this project management role we had a lot of contact with international suppliers and and i was very uh, fluent in several languages so they they used to call me a lot when uh, <laughs> they were meetings with suppliers yep. and at the beginning it was more translating mm-hmm. than anything else but as I got a bit more, uh, you know, more having a bit more experience, I, I started to add my own uh, ideas to the discussion, and it slowly turned more in a negotiation than, than really a translation. Right. Uh, and I guess I, I did it uh, right, and at some point they offered me to join the, the procurement <laughs> team. So it really was quite early in my career. Mm-hmm. I, I had only five years' experience, and I, I was offered the position as a director of procurement in in this first company so yeah quite quite strange way of joining but i've been in procurement most of my career and really enjoy it no it's interesting because most of us that you know i ask this question a lot in the podcast and the vast majority of us in procurement you know it's not that it was a career that we sought out from university it was a career that we fell into and then lived and stayed in kind of keeps you once you get involved in it um it's yeah i think we all we all enjoy it we all love what we do and we all stay here but didn't necessarily set out to begin your career there yeah correct and as a matter of fact when at the beginning uh it was very difficult to find any sort of training or education Mm -hmm. about procurement because uh, well first of all uh internet wasn't uh, even available so it was very difficult to find things so most of the training was really related to sales and then try to to flip it to the other side of the table and mm-hmm. then try to apply it so now you you have a lot more uh, procurement training available that you can that you can attend but at the beginning it was quite difficult but as i said it was it was fun from the beginning and uh, and you know been learning on my own and later from from uh, you know from from colleagues and, yeah. and team members, etc. So I, I know that in your background, you have an awful lot of international experience. You talked about speaking multiple languages. I'd love to kind of hear your perspective on how that international experience has really shaped some of the things that you believe in, you know, that are some some fundamental truths that, that you take from role to role now because of those experiences as a procurement leader. Yeah, so that's true. I, uh, in my career, I had the opportunity to work uh, in Europe. Uh, later in, in North America, I lived uh, for three years. And South America, I lived in for another five years in Brazil. And, and even in Europe, I've lived in, in five different countries. So mm-hmm. that's, uh, 
that's definitely uh, I mean something I, I've enjoyed in life, but it has also given me uh, a very unique experience because one thing is speaking the language, and a different thing is really dealing with the people, and um, that is um, yeah I think it has been very valuable because then you 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 realize how to motivate people. I mean, in your team or, or the people around you in the company, you know, what, uh, what drives them, how, you know, how to interpret even uh, gestures or, or body language, things like that. And, um, but the, the most important thing at the end of the day, I mean, you, you as a leader in, a, in an organization, you, you, you cannot do everything at yourself. So it, it's very important to, to, that everybody believes in what you're saying, that, mm -hmm. that they, they like it, that they, that they're motivated and, and that, that you also are fair with, with their local beliefs. Um, and, and I think that's the, the most valuable I've, I've taken out of it. You find that, um, you know, from region to region, uh, location to location, that there's no such thing really as a global procurement. You know, we talk about global procurement uh, because we operate as a global business. However, when you really get down to it, there's so many different needs at a local level that it's sometimes really easy to lose sight of when you're looking at procurement from a global perspective. Correct. Yes. The, the, at the end of the day, it's a, I think um, Nokia said something like this many years ago that it's a global organization, but acting locally. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what you have to do. I mean, you have to resolve local situations of course, on the on the contractual side, you're trying to bundle your your volumes and and have one voice talking with with global suppliers. But on the other side, each solution for each country is different, and and this is the balance you have to you have to have because if you're uh, trying to to impose uh, a solution that works in one country to another country where it doesn't work, then then you're frustrating people, and and this is ultimately not going to work. Yeah, I want to come back to that in a minute. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, procurement journey that you've been on at Simpress, um, which I think that actually ties into when we get into the details of uh, kind of how you're structured and some of the challenges and opportunities you have at Simpress. But before I go and ask questions specifically about kind of your organization, I just wonder if you could share a little bit so listeners can get a picture of, of who Simpress are. Simpress uh, is a company that was founded in, in 1995 as uh, Vistaprint, mm -hmm. and and later changed its name when it become when it became the the parent company of a group of printing businesses. Um, Simpress is focused on mass customization, which means uh, producing small orders of custom products uh, for for the customers, of okay. course. Uh, with the reliability, quality, and affordability of mass mass produced goods. So, in in other words, selling at the cost of of large volume products that are made to order. Yeah. And uh, and that's the uniqueness of Sempress and really the invention uh, that has been copied by other companies. But but Sempress really was the pioneer in this. And and so you are now, as I understand, multiple. You know, as a holding company of Simpress itself, you've got multiple different operating companies around the world. Is that right? Yes. Uh, there are over 10 different companies, and each company even has multiple brands mm -hmm. uh, that operate in, for different audiences. So it can be private uh, customers like you and me, or it can be for companies, or it can be in, in you know, also even in different price uh, ranges with yeah. different qualities. So it's a very, very diverse uh, setup. So what does that mean for you then in terms of how you have to structure a procurement organization to support, you know, what's ultimately kind of a holding company with lots of different um, and very, very different businesses, you know, albeit around the same kind of theme? How, how do you structure the yeah. group as a, to kind of support that? Uh, so, so procurement is uh, is set up as a service function. Mm -hmm. So we are not a uh, mandatory, uh, let's say, uh, group that defines the rules and and who you know who are the suppliers for each application. We the the way we operate is we provide a service to the businesses to to help them find the best solution for their needs, and of course. Ultimately, the objective is to bundle uh, as 
much as possible the mm-hmm. spend of Simpress to have the strongest possible contract in our favor. So, so operating as a services function, you know, how, what does that mean in terms of, you know, how you're looking and thinking about the needs of the business? Because so many times we look at procurement as being a function. It's something at, at a procurement, you know, we're really passionate about thinking about procurement as a business, you know, as a strategic services business within a business. But it means you've got to think differently and set up your, um, your capabilities differently because of the different needs of the business. So, um, yeah, kind of, I wonder if you could talk me through what ensuring that you have the capability to support each one of those individual business units looks like and how that's maybe different than a traditional procurement team. Yes. Um, so first of all, it, it is very important to to be close to each of the businesses. They're, they're all different. Uh, it's it's not one corporation that shares the same, you know, products, the same culture, the, the same market. So they're all different. So we, we need to be very close to each of them individually. That's the first thing to the management, to the marketing organization, to the operations, etc. cetera. Um, so it, there is a high investment in, in relationships and, and understanding the business. Mm-hmm. And, and on our side, on the procurement team side, we, we are a highly experienced team uh, that have very strong uh, market intelligence yeah we we have um, systems in place that that can provide the background of this uh, we do have the uh, i mean even in, in this decentralized world we have a, a centralized uh, database so we know exactly who is buying what from from which suppliers yeah. the pricing we contracts are shared across the business so everybody has access to them um, and what is very important uh, in your question is that we don't overlap and, and we keep our roles. So we, we, we realize that when we negotiate with suppliers, um, the, the business is, is the end customer and, and we are the, the function that does the negotiation, but we are not competing with each other. So we, yeah. we, we have different roles. We share the results. Uh, after all, I mean, at the end of the process, we, we share the results. Mm-hmm. But by the way, uh, the global procurement team doesn't have a target for ourselves. So it's, you know, one very important thing is to avoid having to have the discussion, okay, this this saving belongs to me or this right. saving belongs to you. This yeah. always belongs to the business. We we don't take any any credit on our, on our own for, for any savings. It's always the business result. And and last thing, uh, the business always is always responsible for the the procure to pay, so the operational process. Yeah, it's actually really interesting. You say that you don't have a target, and I'm sure that's um, it's something that's we're just not used to in procurement. You know, you're also always used to having that savings target and living by that savings target, and then everybody in the business thinking, well, you're just motivated because you want to claim some savings for yourself. You don't really care about or have less of an interest in what business outcomes I want from these suppliers. So it makes it for a much easier conversation, I imagine, when you're not going in with that kind of motivation or perceived motivation. Yes, this is actually, I think, one of the the highlights of the way of working that the the targets are are always the 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 ones we agree with the businesses, but we don't have targets on our own, and we don't have to fight for right. for credit. That that um, that I think that's that's a very clever way of approaching it. We we of course uh, have a budget where each year we we provide information to the businesses of what we forecast will happen with prices mm-hmm. in the different segments of the market. Um, it can be logistics or it can be raw materials or, or anything. Uh, and then we discuss with the businesses, you know, if there are any projects we need to do, like, you know, launching launching a new supplier or, or doing a certain tender or something. And then, of course, it becomes a commitment to the business. Mm-hmm. But But we definitely don't argue about who has achieved the results, the right. results, as I said, they, yeah. before they, they belong to the business. And you're agreeing that with each business individually, you know, based on what their own business plan is and what their own needs are, as opposed to um, just looking at, okay, my savings target is X and business unit Y makes up a certain percentage of my spend and therefore I'm going to apply that savings target, you know, prorate it and say, okay, that's the savings I've got to get out, got, got to get out of that business unit. 
I'd love to ask, you know, as a follow on to that, then a couple of questions, really. The first one is, you know, in an environment where you don't have those formal targets, how are you measuring the performance of your team? You know, what do you look for? Uh, you know, what does success and failure look for when you look across your team? The, as I said before, at the beginning of the year, we, we have the, the budgeting process where we agree on a number of projects that we will execute for each of the, the businesses. We, we don't only agree on the project, but also on the okay. timing of the project. Yeah. And we, we set a target, a financial target for this project. So we, after all, we, we do measure right. it, but it's not like we have, let's say, a 3% savings target yeah. across the board and everybody has to agree a 3% on an individual and on a business level. It, it is based on, on the agreement that we do for the budget. Now, of course, during the year, there are always opportunities that come up that we hadn't thought about mm-hmm. and, and, and make uh, and deliver additional results as there are sometimes unexpected negatives that yeah. we have to fight. So yeah. besides the budget, there is, there is a number of things that are on, on, on forecast. And, and so for my, when you go back to the business and you, you talked about, um, you know, obviously sharing your budget with all the business businesses that you support and, um, at the end of the year, like, how do they measure your ROI? How does the business itself measure that investment in procurement? Is it looking at what you've set out at the beginning of the year, you know, the financial targets, the number of projects, everything you talked about in terms of how you kind of measure performance individually? Is that rolling up? Or is there another way of, of somebody saying, you know what, the ROI of procurement was X, and that means I'm comfortable investing or continue to invest or increasing the investment in procurement? No, it's it's the more the the second one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we of course we measure how successful the project have been. We try to learn, you know, if if something goes wrong, why why yeah. did it go wrong that it doesn't happen again? But uh, it, it is a in a way it's it's a process where where we you know we have to prove. As I said at the beginning, we are a service function, so we have to prove that that we deliver value, and and this is a. And, and we have to prove it too for each of the functions. I mean, right. sorry, for each of the businesses. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's very easy sometimes if you have a larger business where where you have a very successful project that can be many millions mm-hmm. and then to say, well, I achieve all these many millions but right. then a smaller business may come and say, yeah, but for, for me, you have nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's one of the dangers of, uh, you know, when I've worked on the consulting side and service provider side, you know, where you have these savings targets and you do that, you know, you find these, you have these big projects and you save lots of money in those big projects. And you know, that's all well and good for the people who are the beneficiaries of that. And the rest of the business is looking at and like, well, how about me? You know, I still pay for your, you, you know, as a, uh, the way that I look at it is everyone who, all of our stakeholders pay for procurement. They're investors in procurement. And so you want to make sure that every single one of them gets the value that they want out of that investment. Exactly, and and of course the although we are uh, focused for the most part, I mean the the global procurement function is focused for the most part on the uh, source to contract mm-hmm. uh, part of the process, not the procure to pay. I mean we are also engaged uh, in in certain occasions when there are escalations, uh, like I mean there could be quality issues. And that need to be escalated or there can be delivery issues or whatever. Because as you said, uh, for, for a certain smaller business or even for a certain area of a larger business, I mean, a, a smaller thing might be very important right. to have a successful launch or to, to meet demand of a certain country or, or something like that. So it's, it's not as simple as saying, okay, I achieved my three big projects and the rest mm-hmm. doesn't matter. It, it, you really have to be successful across everything, across the, the full range. So with so many different needs across the different businesses, does that change kind of how you approach processes and procedures? Or do you still have kind of the, the, um, the same process that you just deploy into each project? Are you kind of flexing that as needs are changing for each one of those business units? So above all, there, there is a procurement policy yeah. that uh, that we use as a guideline. I mean, it, it sounds a bit weird to, to call it policy, and then the next thing I say it's a guideline, but th- that's really how we work. There, there are, I mean, we got together several years ago, and, and we wrote this policy to say, okay, these are the, 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 the high-level thinking that's behind the way we operate. We shared it with everybody, but 
we're not using it to you know to take them to make them accountable right to do exactly uh, on both sides on our side and on the business side to do exactly what's written there i mean it's just to remember who we are what we are responsible for and 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 what we should be doing to to deliver the results but then as you said we we flex it to each project to each situation as needed and to each um, you know, moment in time, it can be, you know, for example, we, in our business, we have something, uh, a period of the year that, that basically the last quarter of the calendar year, which we call high season, that's, mm-hmm. that's 40% of the business happens in that time. And yeah. then of course, everybody needs to be alert. And, and then, you know, it doesn't matter the policy or whatever, it has to happen. To get things done. And it has to happen fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I love that, that you talk about the idea of flexing a policy, um, because, all too often we get stuck in this kind of rigidity of well you have to go through this process and you have these stage gates and you have to demonstrate that you've done each one of those um and you know that just really uh, elongates cycle time of sourcing projects so often and i think one of the things that gives us a bad reputation is you know a stakeholder saying well i could have done this myself in a week and i'm going to procurement and it's taking me two months because you got to follow that process but at least it gives you some uh, I look at it as almost like a check sheet. You know, these are the things that we should be doing or that we should be thinking about, but we're not necessarily going to apply it to every situation because every situation just might not require it. Correct. I mean, uh, an example can be for uh, if if there is a, a need of something. I mean, the, the the process version of the story would be okay. Now we need to collect uh, offers from suppliers. We need to do the negotiation. Or maybe we need to do an e tender. Et cetera, et cetera. This can take two months or, or whatever, but there might be a need to launch a product. Then we, we sign a contract for a quarter or for a few months, mm-hmm. and then we still do the, the tendering process, but we do it a bit later. So it's, you know, if the business needs it quickly, we can have a quick solution, then yeah. do the formal process a bit later. I mean, that's, that's basically the concept. One of the questions that I wanted to ask was, um, you, we've talked a lot today about um, procurement being a, a services business, essentially rather than a function um, you talked a, a bit at the beginning at, about investing in relationships and the importance of investing in those relationships you know what does that mean for the skill sets or the capabilities that you look for in the procurement professionals you need to actually carry out the vision that you have you know that to, to enable that flexibility it's i think it needs some non-traditional procurement skill sets i'd just love to hear your perspective on kind of what you look for in your team to be able to successfully operate in this environment uh, it, it comes back to to the relationships for for the most part mm-hmm. and and the relationships means that of course the procurement team we we, we interact with different levels of people in the in the businesses so you have the the people that participate in the project but at the same time you, you need to make sure you you have the management uh, on board um, and and you you have the time to to execute the the projects because i mean if if there is uh, if there is too much of a rush the results might not be right. the ones they they expect mm-hmm. And, and at the same time, uh, one thing we, I said before, but I say again now, it, for us, for procurement, it's very important that we bundle as much as we can. Yeah. So we, we try to ensure that, uh, you know, if a business has a need and this need happens in another business, that we, that the cycle time, so, you know, if, if the contract is negotiated annually or, or biannually or every six months or whatever, that the cycle time matches the, the cycle time of the other yeah, businesses, yeah. Become, then it becomes a lot, a lot more efficient. You get a if if one business wants it monthly and the right. other one wants it annually, then then you 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 get crazy, right? So it's it's this relation with the management of the business to to make sure that they understand that they are part of something bigger, and and that takes a bit of time, but mm-hmm. eventually everybody understands because the results are better. Yeah. So from a governance perspective, you know, you're working obviously with individual businesses um, and supporting individual businesses. How do you look at you know, how you are rolling all that up from a reporting perspective and from a management perspective? Are you still keeping it at the, the business level or are you bringing it to a corporate level? So the first level is the, the business. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to deliver all the projects that we have committed to them, either at the time of the budget or during the year. So, and, and if, if 
one or several have been delayed or not been achieved, we need to compensate with with other projects that make up for the difference. Yeah. Of course, we also measure the aggregated value that procurement delivers for Simpris as a group. So, you know, you have this unique position where you're sitting kind of cross-functional. I wonder if that, you know, does that translate into some benefits that you don't necessarily see from a, um, you know, the way that a traditional procurement organization is set up? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, we, We are... I mean, we're one of the very few functions that really interacts with all the different businesses. The, mm-hmm. the business am, among themselves are not so often in contact. We are in contact with them every day. And, and it gives us a unique opportunity that any given project that happens in one business can be very easily shared with another one and, and make it attractive for them. Because don't forget, many times a lot of these projects are not always our ideas. Uh, I mean, most of the projects are also needs of the business that yeah. we together try to find the solution. So the, the I want to be part of it too effect mm-hmm. has a, you know, has a, has a great uh, result because then many times a project that was intended for one business be long, becomes yeah. much bigger with multiple businesses involved. Have you found that it drives competition between businesses too? You know, they, they want to be, one business may want to be seen as the one that is really proactively um, engaging in strategic procurement. And, um, you know, that makes other businesses want to follow suit. Yes, uh, that too. Uh, and and in, in, I would say in, in two different, but both very interesting directions. I mean, first, uh, business uh, businesses don't want to miss out mm-hmm. of opportunities that another one is having. But at the same time, sometimes we, we have a project and, and another business says, well, I, I have a better idea than your idea. This is mine. <laughs> so it, uh, And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you, you have more people thinking about solving a problem and, yeah. and it, it is at the end a much better result for Simpra. So right. it, it can be like, uh, you know, adopting a technology or, or using a different raw material, etc. But then, of course, everybody benefits of it at the end. Obviously, information is really important to the way that you operate and how you're operating across businesses. But how are you ensuring that you have all the data that you need, that the business needs, but also that your team needs to actually help them, inform them, you know, make better business decisions? Well, this is actually at the core of our success Mm -hmm. because the different businesses within Simpress use different ERP systems. So we don't have one place where we can go and check what's going on. We use a a tool called uh, Cievo that once a month extracts all the information, all the transactions from each of the ERPs of the businesses and makes all the, um, the information available both for the global procurement team as well for for the, the procurement organizations in the different businesses themselves. So there we have all transactions, but at the same time, there is also a contract database um, available and, and a project management tool, which is the base of how we operate. And besides that, uh, we have a, a training platform. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a procurement training platform that is used not only for the global team, but we invite all buyers from the businesses. And we have other tools like, for example, an e-tender platform and some others that, that are open and free to use for everybody within Simpress. Well, Evan, I want to really thank you so much for sharing your journey with the listeners here at Procurement. I love what you're doing and what your team's doing in really thinking like a strategic services business. We, we talk a lot at the at Procurement about that being the future for Procurement, to have that mindset. Um, and, you know, what you've shared with us today is really an example, a great example of how procurement leaders who are listening can start to think about that and start putting it into practice. So um, I just have one very last question, and this is, uh, I always say, the easy question. And that's if listeners have enjoyed the conversation, they want to connect with you directly. What's the best way for them to find you? Well, uh, of course, I'm in LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably the best way. Just shoot me a um you know, a request for contact, uh, refer to this conversation here, and I would be very happy to 
and get in touch. All right, great. Well, what I will do is I will include a link to your LinkedIn profile in our show notes page. Uh, listeners can just go to artofprocurement.com slash podcast, and they will find all of the podcasts that we have here at Art of Procurement, including this one. Just click on the pod, and the links are at the bottom of the page. So that will take you directly to Everett's LinkedIn profile. Um, Everett, just one last time, I want to thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Uh, first uh, first time I do something like this, so uh, it was a great experience. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Hi there. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. You can check out all of our back catalog at artofprocurement.com slash podcast, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you never miss an episode. And if you found value in today's show, I'd love if you would tell a peer or perhaps go and rate and review by going to artofprocurement.com slash review. Word of mouth really is the best way to help the podcast grow. And if you're able to do either one of those things, I would truly appreciate it.